So if you remember, um, when we did stress resolution, uh, at the same time we talked about all these coordinate transformations, we, talked, we went ahead and lo looked at, because I just felt it appropriate to discuss it uh, at the same time when we were doing these coordinate transformations to look at fault stress on, stress on faults and other things, to go ahead and introduce at that time, uh, because it's very much in the same analogy, uh, how to determine the stresses in the wellbore. And so we went through even a long exercise in class, I think, uh, where I actually did some coding. And uh, so now we're going to return to that, and we'll use those stress resolution techniques, but now we actually know some failure criteria. So we'll be able to determine uh, or use this information to determine, help us um, with respect to stability in deviated wells. Okay, so almost all wells now are deviated to some degree or horizontal. So it's pretty important uh, that you know how to do this. Uh, there again, if you remember in, in the in the uh, in this configuration, we have two angles: um, an angle delta, as I have it drawn here, an angle delta that is the angle of orientation of the toe of the well. The toe. Do you, do you guys know what I mean by toe? Right? The, particularly. Uh, in horizontal wells, right, the, the toe is you know, the end of the well. So it's the orientation of the toe of the well with respect to north, essentially. And then the deviation from the vertical is this uh, angle phi. So if it were 90, then that would be completely horizontal. Okay. And so with those two angles, then we can define this rotation matrix such that we can take the stress that's in geographic coordinates, this is our northeast down coordinate system, right? The stress that's in geographic coordinates, we can take it into a stress that's in the borehole, okay? A stress tensor in the coordinate frame of the borehole. And then from that, we can use that and the pore pressure to determine uh, the stresses around the circumferential stresses and other things that we've been talking about with respect to vertical wells um, in the case of the deviated well as well. So, so we rotate it into the pearl flame, frame and then we apply these equations. Um, and then with that, we can also determine the principal stresses so that we can basically, if we know the principal stresses, we can write our more circles and we can use our more Coulomb failure criteria, for example. Uh, to determine if there will actually be breakouts in the deviated well or tensile induced dr uh, drilling induced tensile fractures. Okay, so I think we just barely mentioned this. Uh, maybe even I think when I did there was a problem with the figure uh, that day, but um, we we can use this lower hemisphere projection. So essentially. Um, if we uh, go around the circumference of any one of these circles, we're basically moving from northeast, southwest down. Uh, and if we go out along the circle, we move in degrees of deviation. So I think this inner circle is 30 degrees. This outer circle is 60 degrees. And this far outside circle is 90 degrees. So, if I plotted a point right here, what would that correspond to in terms of our two angles? And don't worry if you don't remember delta and phi, you can just give them another name. <coughs> so delta would be 90, and phi would also be 90. So this kind of gives you a picture of, of uh, you know, basically on this you can project, and they call it a lowest hemisphere projection because if you look at this lower hemisphere, it would be the place where the wellbore pokes through that hemisphere, right? the, the, the toe. Okay. So
with that and a failure criterion, in this case, I just used the simplest one, more Coulomb. With that and a failure criterion, we can determine, um, or we can create these plots that give us some information about breakout initiation. So in this case, uh, the stresses that are provided there, along with the pore pressure and the wellbore pressure, or the mud pressure, are translated into or, or moved into the wellbore frame, then turned into the principal stresses. And then with those tr principal stresses, we look at the failure criterion, and in this case, the more Coulomb failure criterion, and they plot the required uncompressive strength of the rock. So if you remember, the more Coulomb criterion is something like, in terms of the principal stresses, something like sigma 3 is equal to sigma 1 minus, oh sorry, sigma 1 minus, let's see. I know what it is in terms, it's, we, usually we write it like this. Sorry. So I'm trying to write it in terms of CO. We don't, it's typically not presented that way. Let me just look up. So yeah, so in terms of CO, it's it's would be CO is equal to sigma one minus Q sigma three, where Q is the square root of the internal friction angle squared plus one. Sorry. Screw to that. Plus the internal friction angle squared. So th this was in the notes, if you just go back and look. <laughs> so basically, uh, again, you, you can compute sigma 1 and sigma 3 from all those formulas I, we just presented. And then from that, you can plot the C0 for a range of deviations. And then in these faulting regimes, uh, with these principal stresses, these are the figures you get. And what you see here, I mean, what you can take from them is, first of all, there's sort of no generic rule of thumb as to what kind of stability. I mean, it's different for every faulting regime. So if you notice, the color bars are different for every case. Uh, in a normal faulting regime, uh, you're going to get more, you know, more unstable uh, uh, in, as you deviate in the direction of SH max. Um, for strike slip, you're going to get more unstable. Uh, in the direction of SH min, and, and then you can see they also, because the color bars, the range of the color bars increase, they're sort of presented in a way that, uh, you know, stability issues are more likely to exist, or you need, you know, the higher these values, the more red or the higher the color bar, these are the higher required values of uncomprised compressive strength, or the higher strength of the rock to avoid breakouts, okay? Now, Keep in mind that this is just a plot of the initiation of breakouts. It, remember what we talked about before. Just because you have some breakouts doesn't mean you necessarily have an unstable wellbore. It really, the, the stability has to do with the width of the breakouts and the fact that it can lead to washout or wellbore collapse. So 
So uh, in the same way, you can plot the case for tensile. So in this case, they basically used an unconfined compressive strength of zero. So if any of the stresses, principal stresses, go into tension at all, then you can have drilling-induced tensile fractures. And so what here they plot here is the required mud weight to prevent that. Okay, so remember um, that we can stabilize the wellbore uh, with mud. Of course, if your mud if you go too high in the mud weight, you induce drilling and induce tensile fractures, and then that can lead to you know loss circulation problems. So what you'll see, like in the stripe in the strike slip scenario. Or in a strike slip faulting regime, what you'll see is that basically any well bore deviation less than 30 degrees, you're going to get drilling induced tensile fractures. And this is observed in the field as well. So, even though I've come to the end of my slides, the lecture is not over. I thought it'd be fun to create one of these plots in class and go through the process of, of doing it so you can see how you know how you do it. Um,